If you've been watching me on Twitch, you know that I've got a SCOG reboot prototype. In fact, I've got a few videos on it already. Make sure you check those out to see some of my initial reactions. Since then, it's been roughly about a week and I do have new impressions which I'd love to share with you guys. So stay tuned until after the break. Welcome back. And at the time of this review, the group buy is still in progress, so don't forget to check out those links down below. This is a fairly pricey keyboard with the base unit coming in at $419, and depending on what PCB variant you choose, can go up to $449. You have a total of 7 color choices and 2 layouts, win key and win keyless. The SCOG reboot has several features including isolated gasket mount, per key RGB, underglow RGB, rotary encoder, RGB strip above the arrow cluster, dampener between plate and PCB, and the big one here is Bluetooth support via BLE daughter board. It's also got this really cool backplate full of ridges, kind of makes it easier to pick up if you ask me. The SCOG reboot I received is a prototype in the powder coated desert colorway with wind keyless layout and a solderable Bluetooth and wired PCB. My prototype unit did not come with the battery and unfortunately I have still not been able to secure the recommended Nokia 5L5C with the correct terminals. When I received this board, I was concerned about one primary issue. The PCB. Previous Percent Studio boards have been known for poorly manufactured PCBs that were dead on arrival or died after a short period of time. In the case of the original SCOG and SCOG Lite, these were both bootmapper client boards and had their fair share of issues. In fact, my own personal SCOG Lite had an entire column shorted to another, causing me to trigger navigation keys whenever I pressed backspace. So yeah. I was definitely paying close attention to this PCB. While unboxing this on stream, King Nesty informed me that they have since changed PCB manufacturers, so quality should be much improved over previous iterations. I also noticed that the PCB now supports both QMK and VIA natively, along with ESD protection on the USB line. Just these three things alone already make it better than the previous SCOG. However, I do have to say, the PCB I received was not in the layout I desire. There is not much I could do with the WKL factor as that's a property of the case, but I do wish it would have allowed me to do split right shift. Other things I noticed was that split backspace was also not an option, and the pipe key has a very tiny soldering pad which I could not trigger a key press with wire or tweezer. Thankfully when I did get to soldering it wasn't an issue, but I can envision this being a problem if you're relatively new to soldering. Once again, I had the privilege of King Nessie watching along on the stream as I built the board, so he informed me that he would reach out to the PCB designer regarding these issues. If I could add one thing to the mix, I would encourage having a USB-C daughter board. It's a lot easier to swap out the daughter board if you accidentally break your port, rather than disassembling your entire board. The biggest annoyance of this board is probably the feet. If you watch my unboxing stream, I pretty much spent half that stream dealing with the feet. It was so annoying. The SCOG reboot has feet in the back in which you can adjust your typing angle to either 5.8 or 6.8 degrees. Adjustment is not something you do on the fly, but requires you to take apart your board. You will need to turn these discs so that the slit lines up at the top. Once you do this, you'll be able to take it apart and move the feet. This is nearly impossible to do, even if you grease these dials. Yes, you heard that right, I use dielectric grease to lube these dials. Anyway, if you do grease it, the improvements are still too minimal to have the dial spin to where you need it to be. Once again, King Nesty has informed me that these feet will be redesigned for the actual production unit. That's pretty awesome because the feet were honestly just so frustrating and pretty much confounded the build more than necessary. Speaking of build, if you don't mess with the feet, the build actually is quite pleasant. With the Gatorade Milky Top Blacks I used, they clipped into the plate just fine. I didn't need to compress the added silicone plate dampener too much, the BLE daughter board fit right in, and the encoder daughter board cables wasn't too difficult either. It was actually a very pleasant and intuitive build experience. I unfortunately still haven't been able to test the Bluetooth functionality, but based on what I've heard from other streamers, it was quite literally plug and play. Hopefully I can secure one soon. As I said earlier, I'm about one week into board ownership and I did notice a few things. 
I got tipped off during one of my streams that the board buzzes, and sure enough, when I turn on in-switch RGB and put my ear about 3 inches from the keyboard, I can hear a high-pitched buzzing sound. Good thing I don't normally type like this, right? Based on boards that I've seen this happen on before, this is actually a result of using a ceramic capacitor instead of using a tantalum capacitor, and sometimes not enough capacitance. If I can isolate which capacitor is connected to the in-switch RGB circuit, I may be able to remedy this myself by soldering one in parallel to the existing capacitor. I'm hoping the production units will have this fixed, but if you're like me and have a prototype unit, this is probably what you'll need to do. The other issue I noticed is more of a pet peeve. The RGB strip here, above the arrow cluster, is actually controlled using RGB underglow key codes, and it's actually in line with the RGB in the logo on the bottom. I always thought it was a bit strange to have fancy lighting where you can't see it, but I guess this is how you would see it. I'd probably change this to function more as an indicator LED, informing me of layer changes or caps lock status. We'll see what I do. Overall, the only thing I really disliked about this board was the WKL layout and the fact that I can't split right shift. The feet, as bad as they are, like the way they are now in the 6.8 degree position, that's fine with me. That's a very comfortable typing angle. I don't ever have to change that. I don't ever have to struggle with that ever again. I really do like the board. As I said, it's got the right typing angle. It sounds good. It looks good. And it's got quite a few nifty features to play with. Keep in mind, I do have a prototype unit, so hopefully some of the issues I did mention will no longer be in existence during the production run. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed this video. And as I said, if you're watching this roughly right when this video comes out, the group buy is still live, so definitely hit up those links down below. And if you've got any questions regarding my board, this board in particular, feel free to ask any of those questions down below as well, and I'll try my best to get back to you. Alright guys, have a good rest of your week and I'll catch you next time. Goodbye now.